Hey everyone, so this review's been a long time coming and I apologize for the wait, but here it is. The air-cooled version of AMD's Radeon RX Vega 64. It's an evolution and some might even say revolution compared to the last gen R9 Fury X. And certainly based on the core specs, there's a lot in terms of basic similarities between the old Fiji card and the brand new Vega. So, 4,096 shaders spread across 64 compute units. It's the same between Vega and the Fury. 256 texture units, yep, that's the same too. TDP, or board power as AMD calls it, well, it's pretty close despite the shift to a smaller, more efficient manufacturing process. HBM memory, that's a little different. We've moved up to the much faster HBM2 memory now. 1.89 gigabits per second now, compared to the one gigabits per second of the Fury X. However, you'll note that the memory interface itself has been cut in half. So remarkably, Fury X actually has a touch more memory bandwidth than Vega. But then there are the clocks, the 14 nanometer FinFET process paired with a push for higher frequencies from the new silicon means that the Vega 64 offers a huge boost in clocks compared to Fury X. Now, whichever way you slice it, it's tons faster than the Fury X, which could barely break the one gigahertz barrier. But here's the thing, the size of the Vega processor. It's big. At 12.5 billion transistors, that's a 40% increase roughly compared to Fury X's Fiji. And in actual fact, the slab of silicon occupied by Vega is larger than Nvidia's Titan XP. So on paper then, the boost in performance should be pretty awesome actually more area performing more operations combined with a massively increased frequency. Oh, and on top of that, AMD says that every part of the Vega processor has seen efficiency improvements and optimizations over Fiji. So there's new tech here, like a deferred rasterizer, plus support for half floats, FP16, or rapid packed math, as AMD likes to call it. Now, this isn't the game changer that the hype suggests, but it's certainly going to be very useful, but perhaps more in the longer term. So the target here, according to AMD at least, is performance leadership in the $500 GPU market, a challenge to Nvidia's GTX 1080. Now I'm not gonna to dwell too much on what many are calling the bait and switch on pricing, only to say that right now at least, Vega 64 kinda of sits between 1080 and 1080 Ti recommended selling prices, so from my perspective, it's got to have the performance to match. And you know, there is some evidence to suggest that, yeah, maybe it does, and I'm gonna kick off with Battlefield 1. Vega 64 sits pretty much right in the middle of 1080 and Ti here in DX12 mode, though we should factor in that this is one of those games where Nvidia's more performant DX11 driver actually hands in an improvement over its DX12 showing. But this is a like-for-like -like test, and it shows AMD delivering the goods. Chances are that super-optimized games like Doom, geared towards AMD hardware, are also likely to deliver. But the fact is that Nvidia can chalk up its own wins too. So if you saw my Vega 56 review, you would have noticed that Crisis 3 didn't seem to make much use of the new hardware at all. The lower end Vega was on par with Fury X, which is quite puzzling to be honest. The higher end 64 with all of its new features, improved efficiencies and much higher clocks, only 12.4% faster, a state of affairs that's pretty mind boggling really. GTX 1080 has a 12% lead over Vega 64, and this rises to a colossal 46% with the 1080 Ti. Yes, it's an old game. Yes, chances are nobody's really playing it anymore, but the fact is that a GPU purchase isn't just about getting the most from the latest games. We expect a substantial out-of-the-box improvement on our library titles as well. And then there's Grand Theft Auto V, 21% faster than Fury X, which is hardly spectacular, bearing in mind the potential of the silicon, plus the clock rate differential, of course. GTX 1080, 21% faster. Now, you'll note that there's not much difference between 1080 and 1080 Ti in many areas of the benchmark, and the reason here is that we're kind of hitting CPU limits. Yes, this actually does happen quite a lot when you're using GTA's extended distance slider ramped up to the max. Now, I'm willing to bet that the AMD DX11 driver is the issue here. It's not quite as robust as Nvidia's. I noted a closing up of the lead when that slider is dialed back, but the bottom line is, 
more distance, more objects to draw, more CPU draw calls, and suddenly even your i7 can start to hold you back, even at 1440p resolution. And so beyond that, well, Vega 64 does a decent job of getting close or matching GTX 1080's performance level with results that generally seem perhaps a touch slower but can drift into margin of error. Yeah, you can see that here with Far Cry Primal. Basically, they are identical. Next up, IO Interactive's Hitman, which used to be a stone-cold AMD win. Pushes ahead with Vega, but not enough to be a game changer. Scene changes actually cause a big dip on Vega though for some reason, which may skew the average frame rate down a touch. But regardless, overall, it's faster with Vega, certainly in gameplay. Ghost Recon Wildlands, GTX 1080 is 4% faster, and this kind of sets the scene for many of our other tests. You look at titles like Rise of the Tomb Raider here, and it sums up where we stand with the balance of our titles. The advantage to Nvidia here with the 1080 is in the region of 5%, and it's a similar scenario with The Witcher 3. 3% in favour of the green team in our Novigrad City bench run, but in none of these cases are we seeing a game-changing difference between Vega 64 and 1080. They are in a very similar class. But as these benches have played out, you would have noticed that by and large, nothing can stop 1080 Ti's dominance. It's just a lot better overall, and this is a bit of a problem with Vega 64 pricing being quite a bit higher than 1080 in the here and now. But something I'm curious about is the extent to which Vega 64 is a generational leap judged by its own terms. So yeah, forget the 1080 comparisons for the moment, I'm more interested in those Fury X stats. Now, by and large, when we factor out the poorer results, Vega 64 is around 27 to 37 percent faster than Fury X in our testing. And that's, well, I guess it's okay. But when you factor in the process advantage, the transistor advantage, and the big boosts in clocks, it kind of feels that we should have gotten a fair bit more here. And to its credit, if you compare 980 Ti to 1080 Ti, you're looking at more like a 60 percent bump. And from my perspective, it's important for both AMD and Nvidia to continue to deliver those generational leaps. It's what makes the GPU arms race interesting. And yeah, it's sort of the measure of progress, generation upon generation. So outside of clocks, just how much faster is the new architecture? I went back to the Vega 64 and downclocked its core to 1050 megahertz. Now Fury X does have a memory bandwidth advantage of 28 gigabytes per second, which I couldn't equalize, but regardless, the results are fascinating. There's definitely something up with Crisis 3. Clock for clock, Fury X clearly has a lead here, which just doesn't seem right. It's definitely an outlier though. Looking at Far Cry Primal here, equalized core clocks sees only the tiniest wins for the Vega 64, just 3.4%. Ghost Recon offers up a 7.7% lead, which is the highest advantage I logged. I also checked out Battlefield 1. Now remember, this game runs really well on AMD hardware, but this is not exclusive to Vega. Again, clock for clock, it's pretty much on par with Fury X. We can reasonably assume that whether it's developer-related or driver-related, the architectural improvements in Vega are not currently being exercised to anything like their fullest extent. Now, returning Vega 64 to full clocks, let's consider power consumption. Our Crisis 3 stress test here saw system consumption rise to 420 watts, a huge increase over Vega 56's 330, and clearly the comparisons with GTX 1080 and Ti are even less flattering. And then there's the reference cooling solution. Now, it could contain the heat of the Vega 56, but it's less optimal with the 64. Now, my advice if you're considering a purchase would be to wait for those third-party cards. We may even get a better performance level as thermal constraints should be less of an issue with an improved cooling solution. Overclocking may become more viable too. I couldn't do anything more with the HBM2 memory here and the card failed the Crisis 3 stress test at anything above 5% of an increase to the core. In this scenario, I can't really recommend overclocking the reference product. So what's the takeaway here? Well, I've spent a lot of my time with the Vega cards now and my initial opinion hasn't changed that much. Vega 56 is a winner. Across most of our test titles, it's on par with GTX 1070 or a fair amount better. Overclocking isn't best suited to the reference design, but you can whack up the HBM2 memory to Vega 64 spec with ease, and in many games, it takes a reasonable chunk out of the Vega 64's lead, which isn't exactly colossal to begin with. Stacked up against GTX 1070 and GTX 1080, the Vega line really is kind of curious. 
Vega 56 is better than 1070, but overall, the same cannot be said of the 64s showing up against the 1080. So we have a gap between the Nvidia products, and by and large, both Vegas kind of sit between them when really what AMD needed was a conclusive win across the stack here. Aftermarket cards may change the landscape, but in the here and now, while AMD has returned to the higher end of the market, I just can't see the 1080 and 1080 Ti juggernauts being derailed, in the short term at least. But yeah, for now, Vega 64 is kind of a bit of a mystery to me. I mean, the basic technological facts are undeniable. A new process node, a 40% bump in transistor count, a 40 to 50% uptick in frequency, a design that's been apparently revamped in all areas. Vega should be delivering more, and hey, maybe it will in the fullness of time with the likes of driver updates and developers getting to grips with this new hardware. I just feel that people kind of buy a new graphics card primarily for the out-of-the-box jump and not so much the promise of jam tomorrow. So what we have here is a good product, undeniably, but not a spectacular one. And there's no notable win against Nvidia here as there was with the Vega 56. But with GTX 1080 on the market for so long, I really wanted AMD to bring more of a fight to the higher level too. Okay, so that's where I'm going to leave things for now. As always, please do like, subscribe, and share to support the work we do here at Digital Foundry. And yeah, if you really like what we do, please consider supporting our Patreon which lets you download everything, and I mean everything that we do in pristine quality. Now, if you have a 4K screen especially, our Ultra HD content in particular just looks beautiful. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching.